Let's turn to our features. Now, our first feature today concerns a topic that's of everlasting import to everyone, really, and that's the graying of the workforce and the steps that business and academia are taking to deal with it. Uh, finding, developing, and retaining great young talent to fill key positions that are open now or will be coming open due to, say, retirement, is a challenge for businesses of all sizes in all industries. It's something that all of us, I think, are, are pretty well aware of. Um, are apprenticeships the new on-ramp to good jobs? And that's the name of an article, <clears throat> right there you can see it, which we republished in Tuesday's issue of the Quality Digest newsletter. The piece initially appeared in the Heckinger Report, which is a media company specializing in issues around education. This particular article was part of a series called Map to the Middle Class, which considers the good middle class jobs of the future and how schools are preparing young people to obtain them. The author is Heckinger Report senior editor Caroline Preston, uh, and she interviewed several young people who are apprenticing at Zurich Insurance North America, which is based just outside of Chicago. I think they're in the town of Schaumburg. Many of them are also taking classes, many of these young people, at Harper College, which is just a few minutes away from the Zurich Insurance offices. Between their coursework at the school, their interactions with mentors, and assignments to various real-world projects at the company, these apprentices are getting exceptional training in areas such as business administration, claims adjustment, human resources, and a lot more. And that really is an interesting part of this equation I wanted to call out a little bit. The fact that this apprenticeship program at Zurich Insurance is based around a service or transactional business sector. Traditionally, we've all heard of apprenticeships in, in manufacturing and, and those let's not be, you know, let's not under, underplay them. Those are proliferating really nicely as well. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this model can work really well in a variety of organizations and work environments and sectors like, you know, uh, insurance, for instance, uh, a transactional sector like insurance or banking uh, can really function really, really well. Service sectors like healthcare, these can function really, really well as well. Um, there are a few different paths to success even within this single program at Zurich Insurance. Most people in the program came into it with only a high school diploma and a willingness to learn. That's, uh, of course, always a key thing for an apprentice is a willingness to learn. Some, however, had bachelor's degrees or even postgraduate degrees uh, already, along with varying levels of professional experience. To them, the opportunity to apprentice at Zurich Insurance uh, gave them a foot in the door at a great company uh, within a solid business sector. Insurance is doing, doing really well, and those are good jobs. Those are good, steady jobs. They pay a good salary, 60000 and above in many cases, even for people in their 20s or 30s. Those are pretty darn good jobs, even in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, now, in addition, Harper College isn't only partnering with Zurich Insurance on programs like this. They work with other organizations with coursework focused on information technology, cybersecurity, cyber and more. One important element that Preston points out in this article is that the so-called learn and earn model could really get a boost from the federal government should it choose to do so. Currently, employers such as Zurich Insurance generally foot the bill for, uh, for programs of these types, um, both covering the costs of the apprentice tuition as well as paying them a, a modest salary while they're going through the two-year program. At one point, Congress had allocated $265 million to expand this program further, but those funds have apparently not been reallocated, according to Preston in this article. So, Bringing new companies on board is perhaps harder than it needs to be at this stage. Um, and you know, this is a good place for me to maybe to riff on the old argument about um, whether this really is or isn't the role of government to support things like this. I mean, many people out there would feel that um, government, you know, should be play more of a laissez-faire role. You know, let let businesses, you know, get the workers they need and invest in it themselves because they're ultimately getting the benefits of that. Uh, the term corporate welfare is thrown around a lot for for programs like this. So many people would say, well, it's not the role of the government to do that. Others would say, well, you know, you think about it. Yes, you're supporting companies who are getting the benefits of having these workers, but you're also supporting those workers. You're giving the, these workers a really good job. You're giving them a path to the middle class, which is part of the, the series that Heckinger is, is covering. And you're allowing them to have good jobs. You're allowing them to, to get educated in many cases, get a degree, uh, get a certification uh, in, in other cases, and really begin to, to, to have some mobility in their own careers. 
I can see both sides of this equation. I mean, it, it really is a fair argument to say, you know, what is the proper role of government? And I don't know. I, I don't know really what I believe, but I think that certainly there's room for debate, and certainly you can see the benefits accruing uh, for the organizations, sure, but also for the individuals that are going through this themselves. So be that as it may, this article demonstrates that an apprenticeship program such as this one can truly work if there is a commitment from uh, companies that want workers and workers who want jobs. Uh, oh, we, looks like we have a question, okay. Um, question from a viewer. I don't like my tax dollars being used for a program like this, but I see the benefits, maybe, <laughs> okay. Uh, how much money do you think would be necessary to support this, oh boy. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, while $265 million was appropriated, I, I believe, if I, if I was reading uh, Preston's article properly in the Obama administration, I don't think that money's being reallocated. I mean, $265 million bucks is kind of a drop in the bucket, really, if you think about it. I mean, um, that's kind of comparable to, to some of the money that, say, the Baldridge program would get or the MEP program would get. Also, it's kind of on the chopping block in the federal budget. Um, I don't know, half a billion? A billion? I mean, I think that probably would be a fair amount of money. Uh, 265 million to me seems a little skimpy, uh, given you know how many uh, you know thousands of people, even with a low unemployment rate, want better jobs and want a path to the middle class. Uh, you know, I think a half a billion dollar investment would be a really good investment for America. Uh, again, for American citizens, not just the companies, but it helps the companies too. So, yeah, I, I think I think something in that nature. Certainly, three three figure, triple figure millions. You know, somewhere in the two hundred, three, four, or five hundred million dollar range, uh, five hundred, maybe up to a billion bucks would be would probably be useful. Um, so, you know, academic institutions. Getting back to the story, um, you know, they make it their business to provide the coursework, and ultimately, the certifications and degrees uh, will 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 do that if the funds are there. Again, addressing your question, the the educational institutions will do it if the money is there, if it's provided um, by the companies uh, getting the benefits of this, or the government itself. Um, Talking about ROI, for instance, uh, for companies, you, of course, would get workers that come in with skills that you know you need because you've helped them develop those very skills during the course of the program. Uh, bringing in people with more uh, general four-year degrees and kind of retrofitting them into the jobs that are available is kind of a less efficient way to do it. Uh, for the workers, they, of course, get the specific training that they want and that they know is going to have a value to the companies that are sponsoring them. So there's ROI definitely for them. Um, a big question I'm sure that many of you have is, can workers leave uh, shortly after graduation? Well, most of these programs, as I understand them, have some limitations on that. But uh, sure, it's a concern. I mean, a company invests money in educating someone and bringing them in and giving them training, and then that person leaves. Well, it's going to happen. Uh, the companies themselves, I think, have to you know, uh, be competitive in terms of keeping those workers happy, in terms of, of you know, financial benefits and uh, the general culture um, that, that the company offers, and that's not a bad thing. Hey, we know that, that happy workers make for happy customers. So I think you know, investing in, in the workers that way, keeping them happy, making sure that those companies have to compete to keep their workers and keep them happy, I don't think that's such a bad thing either. So a good story there from Heckinger Report and, and from, uh, from uh, Preston, Miss Preston, who wrote that, that piece, so really good stuff there. All right.